hope to do today is a book which is off transaction analysis. But again, this particular book, but not all of them, Jackie, would probably be of interest of for seasoned psychotherapists. I'm not saying it wouldn't be interested to students or the lay person. Yeah. But I think it's more specifically for people who have been someone like you of your ilk, somebody who's been around quite a while and has seen the landscape of psychotherapy change. So speaking of that, what's yeah. the book that we're going to talk about today? Okay, the title of this book. The title. Yeah, we'll start off. It's called The Relational Revolution in Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy. So it's The Relational, the relational Revolution in Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy. And it's a brand new book, 2021. When I read the write-up on this, I was thinking, wow, that's that's been printed and published quite quickly with the content of what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. And it's by a psychoanalyst stroke psychotherapist, um, Stephen Kuchunk, K-U-C-H-U-C-K, who I don't know. No, but me I, neither. But no, I will I will put a link underneath this with a, a copy of the book and you know its description. Yeah. yeah. This is a person who's been around a long time and trained, I think, in classical psychoanalysis by the sounds of it, but I wouldn't swear on that. And has seen the landscape of psychoanalysis stroke psychotherapy change over 50, 60 years. And the other part of this book, which you've just alluded to, how um psychoanalysis stroke psychotherapy or relational psychoanalysis as he calls it has to accommodate and change in this global pandemic and to really start addressing very current subjects but they shouldn't just be current it should have actually been subjects for many long time yeah you know race uh you know uh what is called intersectionality nowadays inclusivity um diversity inclusion and how psychotherapists themselves really have, in fact, the whole psychotherapy world or psychoanalytical world hasn't really addressed these subjects, uh, but they're really coming to the forefront now. Yeah, 100%. So, so that's why I think he wrote it. But the book is, and I'll just read it out, the in very short introduction at the beginning. So this book investigates clinical theory and technique as well as the challenges of conducting psychotherapy during the extraordinary twinned circumstances of a global pandemic and an equally widespread societal awakening to the consequences of systemic racism. Two um, heavy subjects there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also it, it examines the arch of how psychoanalysis since it started, um, you know, with Freud and Jung and people like that, and how it's now changed or being really influenced by the concept of what we call relational psychotherapy or relational psychoanalysis, and um, how really the rarefied view of drive theory and psychoanalysis has been left behind, if you want to put it that way. And now we have this really dominant force of what is called relational psychoanalysis, or another way to put it, Jackie, it was often called the relational turn. So, in the, you know, at the beginning of the, the century, you know, 1999, 2000, you had what was called the relational turn in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, where all research showed, and most psychotherapies and psychoanalysis focused on the relationship being the cure you know, being the aspect of healthiness and curative transformation. So there was a movement to looking at the relationship between the therapist and the client as a vehicle for change rather than the modality, whether yeah. it's you know, transaction analysis, existential psychotherapy, that rather than the modality it was driven by the relationship being the most important curative factor. So that's what the book's really about. Yeah. So two twin subjects, like you just said. That's why I said at the beginning of all this, this book is really more aimed at more of the seasoned psychotherapists 
who've seen the arc of change throughout. It's interesting to people who uh, want to know about more about psychotherapy now it's developed and also how the really important societal processes of racism, diversity and inclusion have been left out of the agenda, sadly to our shame, of the psychotherapy trainings. Not yeah. all of them, I hope mine address them to a certain bit, but I think we've been, there's been a lack of looking at some of these really pivotal issues. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And one of the reasons why I was drawn to transactional analysis in the first place was that re relational part of it. I, I dabbled in person-centered, but it didn't sit right with me somehow. Mm. I, f I kind of felt like I had to leave myself outside the therapy room. That's right. Whereas, you know, with transactional analysis, I'm very much part of the therapeutic process as as the clinician, so to speak. Mm. That's correct. And, and you came along and trained in 2010, 11, 12, 13, and that was when it was just after the relational turn I was talking about. Yeah. Most psychotherapy disciplines and core, as well as transaction analysis, started to seeing the study of the relationship as the major curative factor. And to leave that out uh, would be criminal. So yeah. TA changed as well, if you like. So for example, my training is highly relational and there is a focus on the relationship being the focus for change. So, so you're correct. In, in, your, in your day, uh, I can understand that attraction. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what's your overarching view of the book then, The Relational Revolution? What, what's okay, let's your start with that part. point? Let's, let's, let's look at that part of it. Really, the drive theory and classic psychoanalysis is defunct basically, and misses out um, a whole analysis on the relationship and the intersubjective part of the relationship. In other words, what's going on between the two subjects? What's going on between the two people, the client and the therapist? Yeah, whereas, whereas what you got with the classical psychoanalysis for the first half of the century, well, really till 67, 90, you know, 67, 1970, 1980, really, you had drive theory and a real concentration on an expert yeah. who would analyze the pathology and give a diagnosis. And you had a real emphasis on what we call fear association, but more than anything else, a one up, one down position. And there was no, absolutely no credence to the relationship being equal or a study of what's happening between it two people or any ideas that the therapist stroke analyst would self-disclose what's happening uh, between them no sense of any mutuality between the two people no sense of a study of the counter transference of the analyst none of those things were there so you had a very in my opinion one down theory based on actually very old fat old-fashioned well not of the day and also drive theory and sexist, and certainly no sense of any um, taking into account cultural or racism we know it now. It was a very uh, antiquated uh, theory. We can take some of the things from it, but a lot of it was from another era. Yeah. And so what we've seen in this book is talking about the letting go of this early psychoanalysis driven by Freud to a much more modern study of the uh, psychotherapist, the person really, and the relationship between the therapist and the client. Yeah, for me, it's it's quite abstract to imagine how it was, because like yeah. I, say, I only know it as it is now, and the thought yeah. of you know me walking into a room with a client and me being the expert and me being one up, mm. you know, one of the things that you taught me over and over you know with Eric Byrne was I'm okay you're okay in the life positions yes that's that, right that's my yeah, that's right. a lot of the time mm. if you went into a bookstore um, a psychotherapy bookstore or a bookstore that was 
you know, selling books on human development and psychoanalysis pre-1960, every book would really be about how the therapist stays outside the relationship. It wasn't until the 70, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, what we call the relational turn, that you found books about the opposite. Yeah. Which is how we stay in the relationship, how the therapist and the client actually examine what's happening between the two of themselves as an indicator for change. That's a completely new revolution in the last 40 years. Well, I'm glad I only learned it in the last 40 years then, and I didn't do it before. <laughs> oh, yeah, because if you go right back 100 years ago, Freud would have um, said it was all to do with, uh, you know, the, the hysteria was all to do with uh, sexual dysfunction. And it would all, all been around um, sexual dysfunction rather than anything to do with real, real uh, occurrences, I think. Yeah. Everything will be through a lens of sexual dysfunction. Everything will be through a, a lens of uh, drive theory. Everything would be the expert naming the pathology and uh, nothing at all to do with an examination between two people. So where, where does, you know, if we're looking at this book now, where, where does racism and equality and, you know, all those things play in the therapy room? Well, of course, what wasn't ever looked at was the cultural aspects of the two people, the therapist and the client. So for the, the psychoanalytical movement pre-1950, there was a no place at all for racism, cultural effects, sexuality, diversity, because pre-1950, that type of psychoanalysis was, was everything that fitted for one. In other words, you just treated everybody the same. Yeah. If you can imagine that, which I find absolutely bizarre. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing <laughs> so queer bizarre. as folk. We're human beings, but we're yeah. all made up of life yeah. scripts and life stories and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So. How can you know if you, any type of cultural difference, any type of um, uh, difference around sexuality and racism and all the things we we're just talking about went out of the window? You just treat everybody the same through patho pathological lens, and actually in Freud's case, through looking at sexual dysfunction. But even when he let go of that, it was all through you know there was no sense of difference at all. Yeah. You just treat them one way which is totally bizarre. And what this book is talking about is the change over the last century to a completely different type of psychoanalysis, stroke psychotherapy, where there is a taking into account culture, taking into account race, taking into account sexuality, taking into account all these differences we're talking about as highly influential in cure and what happens between the two people. So do you think a therapist can specialise in, in one area? They can do, but they have to take an account. So, for example, a, th a therapist who specialises in eating disorders. Yeah, they can do that. They could specialise in eating disorders, but unless they take in a frame of reference of all the things we're talking about in terms of difference and cultural implication and, uh, uh, you know, where the person was helping them understanding themselves then their frame of reference about you know eating disorders is something missing because somebody is brought up in say some particular cultures uh food would be seen very differently rather yeah. than say a, a take that emotion the food is all about swallowing emotions well i was just thinking of some cultural uh uh, cultures where food is seen very differently yeah so unless we take in those sort of cultural differences and we take in frames of reference about sexuality and difference then I think it colors our thinking about certain specialists say eating disorders in this frame yeah and what what about I, I've had phone calls where people have, have kind of made contact with me and asked me if I would work with people transgender. Have I got any experience of working with, you know, somebody from the transgender community? And I, 
I see everybody as a human being. Yes, I know we're all different and we've got different cultures and different sexual preferences and, and all those sort of things. So I, I openly said, you know, it's not something that I'm specialised in. I'm not a specialist in that area and I can, you know, signpost you to somebody else. But it got me thinking about, you know, do I need to have experience of that in order to have a therapeutic relationship with somebody who is of the transgender community? Yes and no. So I think that uh, your own internal frame of reference, which may be at a conscious level, may include prejudice, for example, you don't even know about. Yeah. For example. Um, and in some ways that does matter and it doesn't matter. In other words, if you are reflective enough to be, to be able to get hold of your own counter-transcendence in the therapeutic conversation, and own that or take it to supervision or therapy wherever you would i think that there can be great curative factors in uh, in the relationship uh, as the client sees a very authentic person in front of them for example uh, where the but it demands the therapists themselves i yeah. think being for reflective in their own state of uh, they don't have the same references it's always going to be a sense of contaminations and prejudice and as long as that's owned and worked through i think there's a lot of uh prospect for cure cure in the relationship because the person on the other side will see somebody in being authentic and you know struggling with issues people struggle with all the time in the society yeah 100%. but if they're not going to go into it from that point of view or that frame, um, we've got a problem. I mean, I think a lot of the trainings of psychotherapy, sadly, don't include enough training in all this. And the trainers themselves, you know, if we look at the trainers, how many black trainers do you see? How many, you know, we could go on and on, and we can see that the people who probably are the trainers or in the power, power positions in the psychotherapy world often are white middle class people. They don't come from other, other places of difference. And that's what the book talks about in some ways, the shame of that, yeah. and the shame of living with that, um, with people who come in, you know, in a, a complete sense of difference from what they're used to and the way they were trained. Yeah. I, I, like, I like your answer to, to that question that I put to you earlier on, because does that work not only with, you know, different sexual preferences or, or anything like that, but also across cultures? Yes. You know, I, I wouldn't like to think that as a white middle-aged woman, I could only see white middle-aged women. Oh, you know I think what I mean? The same with, as... with you being honest in your own character transference and reflection, what that brings up for you. And I believe if you come from that place, the the uh, impact on the client will be highly curative. Yeah, that, that, that fills me with something. I'm not sure what, what, what's going on and resonating with me, yeah. but yeah, it does. You know, I, I've, I've got quite a few clients that are mixed race that, that were involved, you know, with some of the demonstrations down in London last year mm. and felt really strongly about it. Yeah, yeah. You and know, that's and, what you need to bring up in your own, yeah. as a therapist, you, to share your own counter-transference, your own self-disclosure is so empowering with somebody who's never had that from the other person. Yeah, and you know, I, I, as another human being, I couldn't claim to, to comprehend what this client was, was feeling at that time. No, impossible. You know, you, that, that's it, impossible. But as long as you share that and you self-disclose the hopelessness of that or whatever's happening for you, yeah, to you, then that's what I believe is the mutual curative factor yeah. in a relational psychotherapy. And that's what this book talks about. Yeah. And that that is, is undisputable in that therapeutic relationship in, in that room. And yeah. yeah. I think so. And it's bizarre to think of psychoanalysis for a hundred... 75, 80 years from what? Since the birth of his, that book on hysteria by Freud, right up until 
45, 50, 55, where everybody was just treated one uniform way. That's, how, how is that? I often think, how is that? It's bizarre. I think it's, it's, it's so, um, it's hard for myself to get my head around that in some ways. Yeah. So, you know, when you sit in here now in 2021, saying how I can't get my head around how that yeah. was. Do you think in, I don't know, 20, 30 years time, people will be looking back at what we practice today, thinking, how did they practice that way? What's that all about? Do you think there's a big shift coming as far as... I think the big, uh, we've had, yes. I think it was a huge shift in the relational turn at the beginning of the century, you know, where we are, 2001, 2002 onwards. And now we are in 21, and we've seen the birth in society of societal, cultural difference, the, the Black Lives Movement, the, the, the huge emphasis on difference and racism and all the things we're talking about here and on sexuality and transgender and all the things we're just talking about, Jackie. And I believe that if we follow this relational, the way I'm talking about things here, right, then I think we'll, we'll be looked back very favourably. But I believe psychotherapy will go further and further along the path that the curative factor is when two human beings can share their own powerlessness in the actual room. Yeah. I love that. I love the way you put that into words very succinctly, Bob. Oh, well, thank you very much. But I really believe that. I also believe that there's going to be a huge um, development in the study of spirituality and what that means in the psychotherapy room. Um, so I think that uh, we'll, this period will be looked back as favourable. Now, having said all that lot, I think psycho psychotherapy trainings have to change. Unless the psychotherapy trainings change, yeah, that's that's some of the place these changes need to happen. Yeah, and uh, you know, sometimes we need to be a bit radical to encourage change. You know, I, I do agree. It's kind of white middle aged a lot of this. And when I first started my training. I did feel out of my depth being, you know, working class and coming out of school with yeah. not a lot of qualifications. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of the people in my group had degrees that, you know, they were graduates and everything. Well, I mean, I've, now I've got to come to the end of this, uh, but I do want to say things. I, until recently, was a trustee of the UKCP, which is the major regulating body. And my last board meeting yesterday, and we were talking about exactly what we're talking about here, is how can we change psychotherapy trainings to reflect what's happening in the culture and society today as a major, major vehicle for change in the psychotherapeutic world. And really, in a way, that's what this is talking about. I need to get that book and I need to read it. Because yeah, yeah. It it's very easy to read. Yeah, yeah, it sounds really interesting. So thank you so much, Bob, for letting me be a part of this. This is book review number one, and there's going to be many more to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.